Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion on ethics and behavioral science. My name is Mary McLennan, and I'm um, the lead of behavioral science for the UN Behavioral Science Group. I'm joined today by my colleague, Johanna, who uh, doesn't have a video on, but she leads up the UN Innovation Network, which looks at innovation more broadly across the UN system. Just a few words up front here about the Behavioral Science Group. We are a collection of 250 colleagues across the UN system from 40 entities in 60 countries, so quite a large, diverse, and growing group. Uh, we have webinars like these we held with um, external speakers as well as uh, speakers from the UN system. So if you're interested in engaging with us to talk about our webinars or just how we can support you more broadly in terms of applying behavioral science, please feel free to get in touch with us either through the chat here or over email. Um, next slide, please. Great. So for the webinar today, we'll be hearing uh, from our speaker on the topic of the set ethics and behavioral science. Uh, we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. So you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and there you'll also have the opportunity to upvote questions. So you can, we can have a series of questions that are not only um, just listed from you, but also we know which ones are more, um, more wanted to be answered. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So our speaker today is Professor William Delaney. He's the head of the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at the London School of Economics. Um, he's not the traditional academic, I'd say. He's worked in, as, in academia as well as in practice with government. So he knows more the, the practical side of thinking in this space. He, part of his work looks at the ethical considerations when thinking about behavioral science in practice. So that's what he's going to talk about us today. And I will say in terms of this field of academia and practice, there isn't a lot of work. So Liam is definitely one of the leaders in this area of really pushing the boundaries to, to bring the knowledge um, we have in behavioral science to a more um, practical space when it comes to ethics. Just a final note, uh, this topic has come up numerous times in our, in our discussions across the UN system regarding the importance of ethics and ongoing discussions. So hopefully it can be meaningful for you today. So with that, Liam, over to you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. I'm very happy to speak uh, to this group today. As, as Mary said, I've worked a lot uh, in, in public policy and I'm on a number of advisory boards and uh, in, in public policy, including currently working on the Irish uh, government response on, on COVID from the behavioral side. Uh, I've been developing programs in this area for uh, a long time and I've always been interested in the practical ethical considerations that arise when you're engaged in conscious attempts to influence people's choices and decisions in, in public policy contexts. Um, there is a vast literature on this, and, but, I, but I found as I, as I was reviewing it and doing classes with students, it was a very philosophical literature uh, and often very difficult to ground in practice. And particularly when I was doing teaching involving public servants people working in senior levels in different organizations, I was, became increasingly unhappy with how we could actually communicate this work to them in a way that was useful. And uh, what, I, what I talk about today was my attempt to, to do that with colleagues over the years. So we developed a framework over several workshops and over many years of classroom teaching. Um, it's backed up by a lot of background uh, research, but it also attempts to be quite practical. So it's, uh, I'm gonna present a, a framework which hopefully makes sense uh, a framework that looks at the factors that you need to take into account if you're developing a behavioral science capacity in an organization and if you're if you're using a behavioral science team or working with a behavioral science team uh, to do large-scale applications. So I consider it as a, a voluntary self-reflection tool initially um, but I've also been involved in drafting codes of conduct uh, for people who work in behavioral science. So obviously I'm the head of a, a department that trains quite a lot of people in this area uh, we've got several hundred alumni in this area now uh, and we've come together to form a new association in the area which is currently forming uh, and I was involved in drafting the code of conduct for that that involved quite a deep reflection on ethics so hopefully I can say things today that will be useful on that. I'm going to start with a bit of a background because I know not all of you um, are necessarily working in the area and then I'll move into discussing the ethical issues and I what, I what I will leave for discussion is whether you feel the factors that we've identified in our work are, are relevant, are the ones that are most relevant to, to the work that you're doing, whether there's things missing uh, and hopefully it will be a, a, a useful launching off point to discuss this and I do think that any application of behavioral science in practice must, must start uh, from these uh, ethical considerations um, and hopefully, as I said, we will do some useful work on that today. An example of the types of behavioral science frameworks that are used in terms of uh, how, how we influence people. So obviously psychology and different behavioral sciences have been around for a long time. 
Um, but, but there has been a greater interest, I would say, in the last 20 years among government, I think particularly since the Obama administration in the UK, in the US and the Cameron administration in the UK, work that the European Commission were doing, work that the OECD were doing in informally building groups of behavioral scientists into the public policy process. And I think some of you might think, well, you know, is this just psychology or, you know, what's different? I think what's different, if you look at these frameworks, they tend to be interdisciplinary, or I would even argue transdisciplinary, and they tend to be quite practice orientated. So Mindspace is one of the most well-known frameworks. And if you look at the co-authors, they include people that are psychologists, they include people that are economists, but they also include people working directly in government. And, you know, there's no real very clean definition of behavioral science or behavioral insights, but I would say it's an approach that takes a sort of combination of these fields and looks for very practice relevant um, insights or applications that can then be evaluated through research and scaled up in different types of ways. So when we hear things like behavioral insights teams or behavioral insights capacities or behavioral insights groups or behavioral science groups, they will tend to be a mixture of social science, behavioral science backgrounds but driven by sort of understanding people's behavior. So I'm gonna introduce a phrase right now, which I'm, I don't think anybody will like, but I, don't worry, I will explain it and, and get rid of it pretty quickly, which was this idea of libertarian paternalism, which was the idea that you could influence people's behavior uh, while, while still giving them freedom of choice. And this was a very academic idea. I mean, it was being debated in seminar rooms and so on. So you're probably wondering how it became you know, one of the biggest, uh, this book became one of the biggest selling books in any area in the last 20 years, and it's influenced governments, and it's had such an influence on public policy, really probably one of the most influential books in public policy um, of all time, really. And one of the reasons is the, the co-authors, uh, Cass Sunstein and uh, Richard Thaler. So Sunstein um, was Obama's chief regulator, and Thaler is a Nobel laureate in economics who was advising the UK government and I think their publisher understood behavioral science maybe a bit more than they did and said, you know, you need to change the name of the book. And it became Nudge, which became a very influential idea. Uh, so the idea that you could use behavioral science uh, to help people make decisions that improve their health and well-being, uh, and not just at the individual level, that, that you could change the, what they call the choice environment or the choice architecture. So Sunstein did an awful lot of work, for example, on making administrative systems easier, more simple to use. Uh, so administrative burden is one big concept in this area. How do you reduce administrative burden so that people can make uh, healthier uh, choices, choices that are better for them? Are there areas in which people are, you know, getting information that's too complex for them that you could simplify? Are there ways of changing the default option such that it's easier for people? So for example, there's a lot of work on child poverty talking about auto-enrolling people into programs rather than making it very complicated for them to sign in. They worked a lot with people looking at simplification as a set of information. And it became a very, uh, very big idea. And as I said, these concepts like Mindspace then started to arise saying, well, there's all sorts of ways that one could influence behavior as well as you know, legislation and fiscal measures how we communicate to people, uh, which is something we know from a, a wide range of literatures, uh, how we shape incentives. So under what conditions are rewards better than fines, for example, and then crucially things like norms. Uh, and we see that now with, I'm working at the moment on projects like face covering use. Uh, so certainly in Ireland, uh, where, I, where I was working, face covering use became very prevalent um, prior to the legislation emerging to make it mandatory. And it started from almost zero and it went to pretty much 100% on public transport, still a little patchy in, in, in shops. But, you know, that emerged because the norm changed and the communication changed. And then legislation did come in. But it is interesting the way that people's behaviors, behaviors are influenced by certain types of communication, by certain types of norm processes, and then all of these other things. So I guess the idea of the behavioral insights work is to sort of harness these in a systematic way within, within large organizations such that you can think more flexibly uh, about how, how you might achieve different outcomes. And all over the world, so Mary mentioned uh, across the UN system, uh, many people thinking about this area, but more generally, so this comes from the OECD, recently did a mapping exercise uh, looking at areas, uh, looking at countries and governments that are doing things in this area. And it's really a vast 
uh, group now. Um, I would say there's thousands of people working on this area and it's becoming a, a real, quite well-defined area of practice with, with a lot of uh, emerging international uh, collaborations and so on and something that I think is recognizable. I think it still needs work on definition. There's still complexities about how you define some of these things, but I think you're, you're seeing increasingly groups that are trained in this area, that self-identify in this area. Uh, uh, the UK is probably where it's most active. That's why it's quite exciting for me to be head of the department here in London. There's many applications going on, uh, but I think you're seeing it across uh, the world in, in, in many different contexts, which does lead to, um, sorry, a bigger pardon. And one area where we saw it increasingly uh, used was in, in the context of COVID. Um, so my own work uh, recently has been working with the Irish government and increasingly with, with, with working with folks here in the UK, uh, looking at things about how people are perceiving risk, uh, the extent to which they're adhering to regulations, uh, the extent to which they respond to different types of messages and all the different factors that would influence people's behaviour. Um, and I, when we look at something like COVID, and I think the same is true with climate change and with a whole range of different issues, I mean, there may be technological solutions to these issues. There, there may even be large legislative solutions to this issue, these issues, but really, for the most part, we're dealing with mass level uh, behaviour, and you know uh, what I guess what the what, what the WHO would call non pharmaceutical interventions, but what I would think of as behavioural. We're looking at these issues where people face constraints around whether they can self isolate, so real material economic constraints, but also psychological issues around how people understand the information, how people respond to messages, whether they think other people are cooperating, uh, all of these complex, complicated issues. Um, and I think with, with issues like climate change, with other issues as well, I think we're starting to more and more realize that the sort of 20th century belief that technology itself would be the solution to some of these problems is giving way to something where we're, I think, increasingly realizing that preventive health, bit, for example, preventive health care environmental behavior change, these sort of issues. And in the case of COVID, you know, really mass level changes in behavior that had to occur in very short periods of time. And in, in the case of the Irish government, I just give this as one example, I don't want to focus on Ireland, but it is an example where, you know, behavioral science needs to be embedded. And Mary and I've talked about that quite a lot, that this is not about academics giving opinions about theory that are divorced from practice. So in our group, we would have been a group of uh, people from health psychology, social psychology, behavioral economics, survey design experts, experts on experimental messaging and so on. Uh, but we would have been very deeply embedded into the core government national public health emergency response team, which was reporting to the minister. And uh, it was a very exciting project in one way, uh, in the sense that there was very rapid feedback at all stages. And it, it was quite successful. We had quite a lot of uh, good outcomes, particularly from March, April, May, June in Ireland. There was a very widespread perception that messaging was very clear. Uh, we had a change of government, which, uh, as you know, politics can sometimes matter. So there was a bit of a there was a bit of an adjustment process after that. But 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 certainly uh, there was a, a very uh, strong um, benefit of having a behavioural insights group embedded directly with policymakers and it was very collaborative endeavor and one worth thinking about. So I guess coming on to the nub of, of the presentation and what I want to really put out there for questions uh, is how do we begin to conceive of the ethical issues that are involved in projects. So let's say you're in an agency or you're in a, um, a context where there's some issue, whether people are enrolling into a program, for example, is a very common one, or whether there's some preventive health behavior uh, that you might want to encourage, uh, or any of these types of things. Um, how do you then, from the start, uh, embed ethical issues? So as I said, we spent several years reviewing the literature, and I've put together a website, which uh, Mary will make available to you, which, which has all the materials up there. Um, and uh, I often encourage people to use this as uh, what we call a pre-mortem tool. So in other words, it's a good thing to do before you start. And I even do a, a workshop here in LSE where we get people to go through their policy projects. And then after they do that, we then get them to go through the ethics to see whether anything would change. And often it does. Um, so we really believe that these should be salient at the start. And the type of things we talk about would be fairness. So if you are engaging in some project of nudging or behavioral change, 
Um, will it impact on different people differently? In the context of COVID, we were particularly thinking about uh, cases where um, uh, people couldn't self-identify, or sorry, sorry, people couldn't self-isolate, so that just having a behavioral change message that said it's the responsible thing to do to self-isolate would be very unfair on people if they were caring or if they were involved in jobs which made that difficult. And you can imagine cases where trying to put pressure on people to do something if they can't comply would be unethical. Openness, um, is it hidden or manipulative? I think my, my belief is anything that a publicly funded agency is doing in this space should be widely available to the public in terms of explaining what they're doing. And I think to not do so um, isn't, isn't helpful because people will, people will imagine worse than what you're actually doing. And also, I mean, from an ethical perspective, people have a right to know uh, if people are influencing their behavior. There are complicated issues because it may not be possible to get individual informed consent, for example, if you were doing large scale information interventions. Um, but, but at the very least, the, it, there shouldn't be anything hidden about this. And there's quite a lot of literature arguing that it doesn't have any impact on effectiveness and it's the right thing to do. So behavioral teams should be quite transparent. Respect, uh, there needs to be a lot of thought about people's autonomy their dignity, their freedom of choice and privacy, particularly if data is being used. Uh, so normal issues of data protection, but also more, more core issues of whether certain aspects of people's choices shouldn't be uh, influenced or, or, or whether you can find some way to include them in that process. Goals, what are we actually trying to do uh, by doing these behavioral interventions? Are we doing things that are genuinely beneficial for the person or is it is it to achieve some organizational objective and might there sometimes be clashes between those two things. Opinions, so how do we factor in if people disagree with what we're doing, um, including if it's only minorities of people. So it might be the case that the vast majority of people agree that there should be certain types of behavioral interventions, but um, small minorities may not. So we've talked about things like deliberative, um, having citizens assemblies, having citizens involvement in the same way that is quite common now in the health literature. Uh, options. So is it possible that sometimes nudging might be used as a substitute for harder interventions? For example, in the area of climate change, there's a lot of debate as to whether, you know, um, behavioral science type interventions may end up distracting people from harder interventions. From my point of view, I don't believe that that's necessarily the case. And I think behavioral science intervention or behavioral science literature can often say that, you know, small nudges are not enough. You need bigger uh, uh, bigger interventions, but I think it's something to think about and it's something that very much came up in the UK debate, whether whether nudging was leading to a distraction from an early lockdown, for example, was a big debate that came up here, something that we didn't have in Ireland, but it was something that did come up in the UK. And then what we call delegation, which is who should do this, what sort of expertise do you need to do it? Um, and uh, again, I, I, m m what I believe is that behavioural science should be embedded where possible, that it should include people who've got sufficient expertise in terms of the research methodologies, but that they're also embedded in, in policy groups that have the right um, authority to do these uh, types of things and the right sort of involvement with on the ground citizens to make sure that they can be done respectfully and well. And that's largely what I want to leave open for discussion. I'd be very interested in whether you think these are, so that's Richard Thaler, the originator of the nudge concept, and, and then that's Darth Vader, uh, who reminds us about the potential to do these things badly. But I would be very interested in your own thoughts about whether, uh, whether you think this captures the sort of ethical issues you might think about when you encounter some of these ideas, whether you think there's other things we should take into account, or whether there's anything about these ideas that you thought were particularly interesting or resonated with your own area of practice. So I've, I've gone for my 15 or so minutes, so I'm going to stop now and uh, leave it open to questions. Great, thanks so much for that, Liam. That's very helpful to, to give the context of behavioral science as well as to go through the four good framework. So the, the Q&A box is open if you want to put your questions there. Feel free to, as Liam said, mention if there are, if you think these concepts resonate with you in the work you're doing, or if you think maybe there are others or variations of these we could discuss. Or even if you have an example of a project that you've been working on or an idea, and you want to just maybe ask the group or ask Liam to see if there's an ethical issue you've been grappling with, we can we could figure out together. So feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'll take uh, some privilege here as <laughs> the moderator to, uh, to ask a question myself. So it's a bit of a general one and it comes from the conversations we've been having as a group more broadly. And 
um, to give some context in terms of how behavioral science has been applied at the UN system in a general sense. Um, a lot of times UN colleagues work with partners, whether it be academics or consultants to actually carry out this work. And when we start to think about ethical issues, as you mentioned, it's important to have an understanding of the context and really the program and the country and all of that. So what are some recommended nations you have more of the like how to implement this? So when we have discussions with partners about a project, how can we approach some of these topics or ideas in a way that will be um, to actually having more meaningful ethical considerations? Uh, granted, there may not be as much behavioral science capacity and knowledge inside. So the more of the how, um, how this has been implemented, any lessons or thoughts you have on that? Um, I would say a few things. Um, we, are, we are developing um, more and more ways of doing it. I, I think over time, I would, I, would, I would simply ask them to have a statement of ethics. I mean, I know that sounds quite obvious, but uh, so for some organizations that I've advised, they, I think they thought I was going to suggest something ex exceptionally complicated, whereas really what I, what I was suggesting to them was simply have a, a, an explicit statement. So if you're hiring a consultant to work on a project, be clear that they, they actually have thought about it. Because uh, I know that sounds like a strange thing to say, but it's not always the case that they have. Uh, and I've seen some examples recently of uh, academic groups doing interventions in developing countries where it was clear even even a moment's reflection would have led them to know that they shouldn't have approached it in a particular way. We had a, a recent paper published, for example, looking at an elect electricity interventions in Nairobi where that generated legitimately a lot of controversy because they looked at, for example, threatening to cut the people's electricity off as a randomized control trial arm. And you know, you, can, you, you sort of think even five minutes of reflection in a proper ethical way would have, would have ruled that out. Um, uh, so that's the first thing I'd say, Mary, is just literally ask them, give, give us a statement of what your approach is to the ethics of interventions. I think also more, more formally, I think increasingly being clear that somebody on their, on their, on their team would have capacity and would have a particular knowledge in that area and particular experience of it. Uh, and I think also, um, and it's not, not so much quite ethics, but I really think what, what, the health, what health researchers are doing is increasingly what I think should be across the board, which is citizen involvement, so that there's some clear ways in which anybody who's doing any sort of behavioral change work is, is consulting with groups that could be seen to be representative of the groups whose behavior is going to be changed. So they're not missing some aspect of context that could lead them to do something that would be either offensive to the people or, you know, falling, falling short of some, some notion of respect. So, sorry, I, that's not a complete answer, but hopefully that gives you at least some ways. So have a statement of it, look for evidence of experience and reflection of it, and also look at evidence that the, that the people will have some sort of pre project phase where they will either consult with affected people or uh, develop some sort of um, framework for, for dealing with it. That's very helpful, Liam. I think that helps to outline some of the, the ways we can do this. Um, and I'd be interested to hear from you, have, when you carry your projects in this space, when you've explored behavioral science thinking, have, do, do you ever explore these sorts of concepts and ideas? Feel free to put them in, in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so another thing that we had discussed as a group, I'm just going to take it from here and ask my questions while you put yours down, um, is how we can, can do this collectively. So as you mentioned, sort of health is, is, works in one way, other working across the UN system, there's a variety of ways of working as well as, um, as, well as different fields. Um, what are some, to what extent do you think it could be generalized across sort of a whole government approach or a whole UN, or should we have specific ethical considerations for fields or for health or for environment or for things like that? Um, just your yeah, thoughts there, Mark. That's, that's a really good question, and that's come up quite a bit. I mean, I think every project has its own issues, right? I mean, like if you even if you think of, and um, so I, I would say that, um, yeah, you, you, would, you would, particularly if these are big projects that are affecting uh, a lot of people, then obviously you want uh, to have specific issues. And, and, you know, I think environment and health, as you say, would have different issues in a broad sense. And even if you get down to the project level, I still think, uh, so what I mean, what I've started to recommend is that any organization doing it at the organizational level would have some statement of, uh, you know, I mean, for example, um, I work with one group uh, a, a public uh, a public agency that was charged with changing environmental behavior and they just developed a simple statement on their website that you know anything they do 
they're committed to making available um, and that anything they do is transparent and taking into account at these types of things. Now, different agencies may have different constraints in how they phrase that or different ways in which they would want to phrase that, but I think it's a very important one. Um, and again, I know in practice, making things available rapidly can sometimes be challenging, but I do think transparency where possible is good. So even in the, in the case of COVID, you know, we often had journalists emailing us, you know, we want to know exactly what you're doing tomorrow. And you would tell them truthfully, well, it isn't actually going to be out for a while, but, but, but we, we had the minutes of our meetings up and we had the publications up as we were doing it. And there was no, there was no way in which it was hidden. And I actually think some of the difficulties that arose in Britain was that transparency wasn't always there. Um, and, and, um, so, so yeah, I, I would say, I would say things like that. I think organizations should have a, a sort of overall statement, particularly if they've developed teams in the area, uh, just a statement of the sort of ethics and transparency of the team. I think it saves, to be honest with you, I think it, it as well as being the right thing to do, I think it's actually an easier thing to do because it saves people then imagining what you might be doing. Uh, often I think in these cases, just telling people in a very straightforward way, uh, and the best behavioral change projects are ones in which people actually agree with you. Like you're often doing things that people agree in terms of improving health or improving the environment. I mean, you see that with COVID, the po population support for a lot of the behavioral change work across the world has been very high. So, so, so you know what I mean? It's, a, it's, it's good for both the effectiveness and the coherency of it as well as the ethics. Um, Mary, will I let you um, moderate the chat? Maybe you, you, will, you will tell me what questions sure. you want me to do it. Yeah, so I can, I go on. I mean, we can, we can do it together. I'll maybe announce them for people who aren't looking at the chat right now. Um, so the first one here is just to maybe make it more concrete. So can you give an example of a project where ethics issues were taken into account really well and ones where they, where they weren't particular just to make it a bit more illustrative. Yeah, that's great. I think I think that question might come in just as I was talking about the other ones. I think I think my favourite uh, example where we really yeah. got the ethics right was the one I worked on in. Sorry, there's just a noise here behind me. Excuse me. Uh, my favourite example of I think where we got the ethics right was was when we worked on the COVID example in Ireland, and because we had a very clear statement from the start, it was very transparent, um, and you know we we had really the right expertise. It was properly embedded. And everybody on the project really were public service minded. And, uh, and I mean, if one of the people used to have this for good thing sellotaped to their desk as we were doing the work. And I felt it really improved the project. It, 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 was, it was a remarkable project, actually, in terms of the it, it was widely known that we were doing it in the public. And uh, people very much uh, agreed with it. Um, one of my co-investigators was a former BBC journalist who turned turned into a scientist. So he was he was out there telling people about it a lot. But I felt it was it was a privilege to work on actually. It was it really felt like we were, you know, doing something that was very inherent. Um, and, and it really came close to me to why I do this area, that this was about not about manipulating people or not about just changing people's behavior for the sake of it. It was about achieving a a a life saving objective that people for the most part, commonly agreed. In terms of some of the bad examples, I mean, I, I'm originally from an economics background and you know, there's some great examples in economics of very strong work. I think there has been examples recently of stuff that I just cannot fathom how it, it would have happened. Uh, and in these cases, it will often be, you know, often, to be honest, Western um, high-ranked uh, universities going into countries where they may have some local capacity, but don't don't really have much understanding of the environment and doing things where, you know, you, you get a sense very quickly that they're being done to generate data for research publications rather than really being in the in the spirit of the of the work. Now that's a bit unfair because I'm sure if people were doing this for here, they may say, well, research is important and they're and they're right. But um, I think uh, the recent electricity randomized trial in Nairobi. Uh, to me, it wouldn't, it, it would fall afoul of a number of different things here. Now, I don't mean it in a very legalistic way. I don't think these are quite sharp, defined legal concepts. I just mean from the point of view, of, if you could read that paper and say, do you truthfully think that the people who were in, the, in who were being <clears throat> sort of subject to those interventions, were they being treated as fully sort of participative citizens or were they being 
you know, were they basically being treated like um, behavioral subjects? Uh, and I think, think to me, that's the issue. You, you know, it's a very subjective thing, but I think you, you need to feel that the people that are being in the study or in the intervention, if they knew they were in it, what would they think? Would they feel it was good? And I felt we got that with COVID. People really knew what we were doing and agreed with it. Whereas with some of those interventions, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No, those are very good points, I think, to keep in mind as we, as we <laughs> apply behavioral science broadly. Um, so I have a question here from Anne, who I believe from UN Women. So she's referencing some, uh, an open dialogue session they had for their He for She campaign. And um, in some of the discussion, the question was asked, how do, you, how do you know that your behavior is wrong until someone points it out? So is this, just to get some clarification, is that a regular kind of nudge? Is it training, is it open dialogue? So just how, I mean, thinking about maybe that specific approach or that specific kind of area of some sort of he for she. Yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting. Like if you're looking at those sort of uh, behavior, I mean, behavior change initiatives, uh, and I know there's more than behavior there. You're talking about culture, uh, and other things that don't always just map straight down onto designated behaviors. But uh, I think the, what this approach kind of lends itself well to in those sort of contexts is it, it maybe extends the ex extent to which people think of other ways of doing things. So, uh, and I, I certainly find stuff like Mindspace or even, you know, other versions of that that have emerged. When you bring those into rooms where people are planning projects like that, you know, what exactly is a nudge Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, can come up, but it, I think what actually happens is it ju it just gets people thinking about it. It gets people thinking there could be all sorts of other ways, and it gets gets people thinking about what might work and what what mightn't. Um, so in the case of you know promoting different types of behaviour like that in the workplace, is it about information? Is it about the right messenger? Uh, is it about creating norms? And uh, you know, I, so I. I, I you, it's a good point, like what is an actual nudge as opposed to, in some cases, harder interventions. But I, th I think the behavioral science piece is that you get this sort of very interdisciplinary approach that opens up uh, different types of things. And there's a huge amount of work now going on on organizational work on looking at promoting things like debiasing promotions or debiasing hiring. So there's some brilliant work, people like Iris Bonet at Harvard, looking at how to create organizations that uh, are less biased in the way that they hire, particularly in the financial industry and in tech. And we've initi an initiative here at LSE called the Inclusion Initiative, which looks at behavioral science being applied to make typically male-dominated organizations more uh, function better, avoid groupthink, uh, those types of things. So, sorry, again, it's not a, not a clinical answer to your question, but there's just lots of really interesting work that, that, that work at that intersection. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I think there's a lot you could tease out there and it just doesn't know. We had Iris Bona speak at um, our, our summer webinars last year and she was great. It was very well received. So good, good to call back to that too. Um, so next we have Pina from UNESCO and she has a question regarding recommendations to improve the integration of behavioral science um, and ethics and management processes. Oh, I see Pina's joined. Would you like to ask your question yourself? Pina, feel free to unmute. Go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Ah, great. Hi, Liam. Hi, Marie. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, just the question was just uh, more in the context of what you just referred to, Liam, I guess, more on the management processes. I mean, I think there's a big, big need as well for uh, especially international organizations to be more aware of uh, areas where actually behavioral insight and also the, the ethics component can be beneficial in order to improve um, internal processes or practices, um, such as you just mentioned in, in the hiring, for instance, area, but also uh, an area we, uh, UNESCO in particular, is trying to uh, um, advance a bit more is the social responsibility or accessibility um, area. So I, I would just be interested in hearing a bit more from your experience. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I mean, one, one, one thing I think is, I mean, there is a big debate as to whether you can debias individuals, right, uh, across a whole range of different topics. But I, one thing I would say is, I've done a lot of sessions myself on things like, you know, uh, so Daniel, Daniel Kahneman has a really interesting article on 12 common mistakes people make when they're approaching large scale decisions. And I've done that with many organizations and it, it 
yeah, it has a wonderful effect. It's a really wonderful thing to do. And it's something I think basically any manager uh, or anyone would, you know, I, I think of myself, like I've taken over a department at the moment and, you know, I know it's only an academic department, but still hundreds of students and we're going through COVID and we've all sorts of plans for the future. And I'm often observing what's going on in my mind when we're thinking about the bigger decisions to make. And, uh, and I think that's one thing I would say. I, I think I, I personally, I would have some element of decision making training for every high school student in the world, basically. I think there's something about it that there's still, there's still a debate about its precise effectiveness, but the experience of doing it is certainly very good. In terms of applying it to organizations, I would say there's probably better evidence for reshaping the actual structure. So for example, having more diverse boards, uh, those types of things than there is for that you can actually de-bias an individual. Uh, and then in terms of integration of the BI work, uh, I think the good thing now compared to 10 years ago is we've increasingly seen ways in which it can be done. Um, I mean, the, the, we used to call this uh, the behavioral team heuristic, which was the idea that once an organization got to a certain level of interest in behavioral science, they would immediately think about, let's have a team. And that works in some contexts, but I think, I think it's worth thinking about the flexibility of different approaches. Uh, and I've certainly worked with some agencies where they've sort of uh, trained a couple of existing people who then manage the work and it kind of fits into their flow quite neatly without changing anything about the organization chart. So I think that can sometimes be a very good way of, uh, of embedding it. So yeah, again, I feel I could say a lot more there, but I think that that's, that's probably enough for, for that. Okay, great. Um, next, I think we can hear from Nargiza um, from I think the Secretariat. Would you like to ask your question or state your comment? You can unmute yourself if you'd like to. Sorry, I had some background noise. Uh, no, I was just, um, um, I read the book actually and I really liked it. And when I was reading it, I found myself that um, thinking about the line between um, libertarian paternalism and, and choice architecture, very clever choice architecture, which is you know, very applicable to what we do. And um, I could see how we could implement it with a lot of programs here, but at the same time, some of it, in my mind, really bordered on the other side of it, which was a little bit too intrusive and taking people's choice away, right? So I was always in my mind when I was reading the book thinking like, how do we guard ourselves against crossing to the darker side? But I've, it's, not a, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment now that I um, look at the for good framework and the um, ethical dimension, it kind of, in my mind, is the framework that would guide you um, in, in clearly setting the guards. Thanks. Yeah, it's a wonderful uh, comment. Yeah, I mean, for me, I got quite frustrated uh, in the couple of years after Nudge because I felt, even though the authors themselves, particularly Sunstein, is a very, is a very rigorous thinker, like he comes from a legal background and he, he's always thinking about issues of safeguarding and he's, he's brilliant to speak to on these issues. But I did feel the way the debate was going, it, it seemed to live in a world where everybody was benevolent and, you know, there's no conflicts of interest and there's no, you know, real world politics and things like that. And the more I would talk to students, you know, would say things to me like, you know, it depends on maybe you don't want your government nudging you, maybe you don't trust the institutions. So I, I felt that the, for me, the discussion of behavioral change to be useful needs to be about these sort of issues up front, that there's institutional uh, context and, and that way you can actually at least make it make it explicit from the start what it is that uh, you're trying to do and separate out different types of things. But I think if you've got an agency that's trying to serve a public function and that it's in their mandate to serve a public function, then, then I think some version of this works quite well. If you've got agencies, uh, for example, private companies are interesting because, you know, there may be things that large banks do, for example, that they that would be called nudging. They may they may have incentives, for example, to get people to save, but they clearly have an incentive to get them to save in expensive products rather than cheaper products. So, I mean, sometimes you get all these conflicts of interest, and um, I think a framework like this, or at least some advancement to this framework, would at least make those things explicit so people know know what they're doing. 
and know when different types of things are appropriate. But um, but yeah, you're right. The the book itself doesn't, and they're releasing another version of it this year. So Sunstein has sub subsequently wrote a brilliant book on the ethics of behavioral science. So I'm hoping the revision of the book will have a bigger influence on it. But uh, and they may even cite our framework. I hope, but uh, we'll see. Great, thanks, Liam. We'll be sure to share that when it comes out so you can, <laughs> you can potentially read it. Um, so next we have Rua from UNDP Jordan. Uh, would you like to ask your question directly? It seems like there are multiple sections to it. Go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yes, hi, thank you for the presentation, Liam. My, my question is on actually a project that we're currently working on. Uh, which has been with a consultant, a behavioral science uh, yeah, expert organization. And it's been around positive masculinity, which is kind of a trend that came about from COVID and, well, in Jordan, the fact that actually not, it was actually the opposite that was happening, which is, you know, um, most of the, there was an increase in like domestic violence, which I think has happened in other places as well. But then there was a smaller like a kind of percentage of people that were men specifically who are taking on responsibilities that are usually, you know, left to women. So that's just to give some context on the project. But so we've been working on this for like, I think it's been about two months now. And I'm a bit concerned about uh, the kind of lack of involvement of people beyond UNDP and the consultants. Uh, so in, throughout the process um starting off to get like the basic data the use a sentiment analysis tool which was applied on uh, facebook uh, but beyond that there wasn't any like citizen involvement and when it came time to select uh, to just like come up with or select target behaviors and shortlist that and then also the step after to select the intervention for the nudge we raised like a few of us in the UNDP staff, some of whom included gender experts, uh, you know, raised the question of whether we could do these kinds of sessions on picking these behaviors and intervention with people beyond UNDP. And the answer we got was this is a pilot and it was so the partnership with them is three months. And they've been saying it's a pilot so we don't have time but also that even if we get people's opinion on whether it's like defining what masculinity is or involving them in a selecting a target behavior or an intervention, that, that doesn't necessarily translate into a better nudge or a more effective nudge. Um, so we've, I mean, although we've raised these concerns, we've ended up taking kind of their word for it, given that they're the behavioral science experts, but it has kind of not at me. And now seeing this framework, I'm a bit concerned that we may not be like the, the point on opinions that there was there's uh, under that framework, it says like something, I can't see the image at the moment, but um, just like making sure people are comfortable with the idea of the nudge or something like that. So I'm curious as to what you think. I mean, is it is it normal in a pilot to not be able to really engage people or is this like a an ethical concern we should be thinking more about and, and actually pushing the consultant to engage more people yeah I, it's you know obviously it's very difficult for me to, to talk very specifically about the project because of the constraints and resources and things but I, what you're saying resonates a lot with me in terms of like I, I like the way that you're thinking about it which is it's that instinct to move a project away from you know a sort of closed loop of people who may come at it and I think that's happening in COVID, with co in COVID in many countries. I mean, in, in my, even in, and I've spoken very, in very good terms about my experience in Ireland, but at the same time, um, in the entire group, including all the epidemiology experts, all the government officials, the behavioral people, all that, there was about 140 people, but every single one of them would have been, you know, reasonably senior, uh, reasonably well-paid, reasonably secure, <laughs> civil servants, academics, researchers. And I did have a couple of moments where I just really sort of wondered, you know, is our communication starting to reflect that? Uh, and these are the topics that we're, we're doing. And, it, and one thing I would say, we were constantly out and we were constantly listening. But even there, I was starting to wonder, like, is this enough? Like, you know, we're, we're, we're missing things. You know, we're, we're making recommendations about high risk groups um, who are in, um, you know, very different circumstances to the to the people that are in the in in the um, in the room, uh, 
um, and, and I'm becoming more enthused by um, people that talk about actually having those folks in the room when you're developing the project. Uh, but having said that, I don't want to be too didactic about it. I mean, this is not a framework that, you know, it's, it's not like the, the consultants have violated some, you know, ethical principle that's there in stone. Um, and they may have a point that in the duration and the resources that they have, it allows them to do something with, you know, internet data that could be a useful input. So, you know, I don't think we could think of this as being a, a sort of ethics um, you know, trapdoor that people fall through. I don't think I don't think we're at that stage yet. Uh, I mean, we may not want to be at that stage, but but it, but you, your instinct is right, though. What this framework is doing is it's it's getting you from the start to even have that in your mind and to think about are there ways we could uh, push in that direction. And also, it may it may help you contextualize their findings. So be very clear with them that if they haven't consulted or if it hasn't actually solicited concepts from people on the ground, that 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 does place a limitation on what they're doing. It still could be very valuable information, but it would need to be seen in, the, in, in that context. But yeah, it's very interesting to hear your experience of it. Mm -hmm. No, definitely, Ru, that's very that's fascinating, I think, and it parallels some of the others that we've heard across the UN system as well. Um, and one thing that we've talked about in previous webinars that um, might be helpful to bring up here is the idea of the diagnostic and behavioral science, and to what extent do you need to understand the context and the idea and what the principle you're applying and how um, and doing that. So I just have a question, maybe it kind of builds on Rua's of looking at these topics that I think even knowing a bit of the academic literature and space that are pushing the boundary, gender-based violence or peace and security, and these are areas that are potentially ethically can be very challenging, not even applying behavioral science. Um, so this provides a good framework to start with that, but um, there's a question here regarding what is some of the what can we extend to lower resource settings compared to like you mentioned a lot of your work was in higher resource contexts. So to what extent is this is applicable in these more very nuanced settings and to what, how should we be taking these broad concepts and, and drilling down? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, another fascinating one. I mean, there is obviously a lot of discussion about whether this individualizes what we'd call wicked issues, wicked problems, the phrase used to be used. So if you said something like climate change or, or conflict. Um, and I have a few thoughts on that. I mean, I think one would be going back to the issue of delegation that, you know, a lot of behavior science people are sort of generalists. They would have methodological training and they have skills in, in, in terms of uh, applications, but they won't necessarily have knowledge of something like conflict. I certainly don't. Uh, so I, th I, I think there needs to be very deep level sort of resolution processes for how you bring different people together. Now I would say, so just briefly going back to, to, this, to this chart that, so if, if I was thinking about a project like conflict, and I have been asked to get involved in some projects where I don't feel I have expertise on the domain, and I don't want to say anything about the domain that would lead, but, but where I would have expertise in terms of how you would gather data, how you would evaluate things, uh, how you would report on it, uh, and so on. So I think that's one thing, that if you're talking about um, bringing behavioral science into projects like that, it should be brought in in a way where, where it's embedded in groups. And that, you know, from a science point of view, that can be messy. But from a practice point of view, it's important because it needs to be clear that people are in contexts where, where you've got the appropriate expertise and embeddedness in the policy domain. In terms of the low resource versus high resource, I mean, again, it's a very, it's a very interesting one. Uh, I mean, there is this sense that, you know, uh, Sunsin and Tyler have said this a lot, that one of the advantages of some of the behavioral science approaches is that, that they're very cheap compared to, and I think that's one of the reasons why they've become popular over the world. They often allow you to do things more quickly uh, and certainly are, are cheaper than sort of large scale technological uh, solutions. I think in practice, though, as you as I think you're correctly pointing out, um, you know, if you're talking about, you know, hiring consultancy teams, um, that isn't always possible. Um, I think what's happening, though, I think you're seeing it in the Middle East um, that you've now got like groups in in Qatar, you've got groups in in a really, really good group in the Lebanon. Uh, who, um, who've who developed local expertise in this area and have started to spread it to their policy folks. So I think there's an awful lot that can be done. I hate saying this as somebody who who likes to develop resources for, for behavioral science projects, but I, I, we, we did a lot of good projects in the Irish context for 
for very little cash money, if you know what I mean. It would have been existing civil servants who had an interest and had capacity to do it, uh, sort of reorientating their approach. So it, it wasn't actually a huge outlay. And as I said, in, 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 in increasingly this is moving away from being a sort of British American thing to being something that you're seeing all over the world and that, that extra capacity itself. I mean, as I said, I'm amazed by how quickly the group in Beirut have developed and they're doing like really interesting things across whole ranges of, of projects. And I, th I think they will, groups like that will point the way towards how this work will be done. I mean, you obviously have a lot of projects that are funded by groups like the World Bank in different countries, but I think that's a slightly different, um, you know, that's another way of doing it. But, uh, but, but the, the capacity that's emerging in some countries will be a fascinating one on that point in the future. Yeah, that's a very good point, Liam. I think, so the way we talk about capacity often within the UN system, so how we're, the UN behavioral science group, we're trying to build this in the UN, but then ultimately part of the way the UN functions, we want to also help governments to build up capacity as well to a certain extent. So there's kind of two elements to that there. Um, so yeah, and I think there, I just want to mention as well, there are some pockets of really amazing work in the UN system already. They may not be well known or out there, but there, there are groups of doing great work already. So hopefully we can leverage that and, and build some more knowledge across the system. And I did like your point, it's a point that I have to bring up as well about working with experts in the field and behavioral scientists. I think there's generalized behavioral science knowledge, but ultimately, you know, I'm a health economist by training. I'm comfortable in the health space. I may not be as comfortable in other areas. So, um, so yeah, definitely acknowledging the experts in the area as well as um, citizens and people on the ground and the behavioral science knowledge to, to move forward. Um, it looks like we have a question here from Kat from DCO in New York. Would you like to ask it yourself? Sure, thanks, Mary. Um, hi, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Just um, some questions about um, the uh, opinion um, ethical dimension. Um, you mentioned sort of engaging with uh, sort of dissenting factions on, on either of these teams, or does that also apply to uh, consultations that you use? You know, there might be people who, you know, uh, give consent or agree with your approach, but then a lot of dissenting. So at both levels, like how do you deal with dissent and how does that affect then the project and how you go about it? Um, also would like to hear more about actually conducting these consultations and what is it that you're aiming for there? Are you trying to persuade them that like, that this is a good approach? Are you informing them of all the range of options that are the policy options that um, are on the table? And um, then they get to, they kind of identify with or express some kind of preference for what's appropriate. I'm just trying to get a sense of what you're trying to achieve um, and how you conduct those consultations over. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. So um, in the Irish context, I, I, I certainly wasn't the person who was driving them, but I was involved in, in one of them where we where there was the citizens assemblies where you'd bring sort of representative groups of people. And the idea there is is, is really just to get a sense of what people actually think. Um, and, and one thing I will say to you is media will amplify certain types of dissent. Uh, because it uh, and that's and particularly social media will amplify certain types of dissent. So one thing that was very interesting with the COVID work, um, and I think this is true in many countries, is is that it often looks like the public are outraged or they're about to you know break down or the norms are about to collapse. Whereas often that's because you know everybody who's complying is already staying indoors, and people tend to be quiet. Like if people are not if people are complying and they agree, they don't tend to go to social media and shout that. I agree with what the government's doing or I agree with what the policymakers doing. Whereas if you've got, you know, somebody who thinks it's all a conspiracy theory or something, uh, they will go up and it creates this impression that there's far more dissent than there is with some of these issues. So I think one thing that's really useful is often just to, to see to what extent this actually is happening. So, I mean, one, one thing we did a lot with the COVID work was actually just to look at the levels of adherence and to get firm views on, on public attitudes. And again, I'm not sure how it played out all across the world, but certainly in most countries, you had quite a lot of people were afraid of the virus, to be honest, in most countries. And they're, 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 they wanted governments to do pretty big things. So that was one thing, was just to clarify, you know, try to find good methods for understanding what public attitudes are um, as it pertains to things they may have to do if their lives are going to be affected by a, 
behavioural change. And then in terms of these more de detailed things like citizens' assemblies, I mean, I'm getting to the bounds of my expertise, but I've worked with a lot of people on these. And uh, yeah, you're, you're really trying to see if people have had time to think and go through the arguments, what would they come up with? And then that can be used as a way of then saying to people, look, we've had a trustworthy way of taking your views in. Um, so we've used it in Ireland in the context of very controversial issues. I mean, the, probably the most the most divided that the country was, was uh, around reproductive rights. And uh, I mean, that was partially mediated through a citizens assembly approach. And uh, now I'm, I'm saying this like, this is something we routinely do in behavioral science. It really isn't. Uh, it's something that we should do more of, I think, um, um, particularly in, in, in areas like climate change uh, and in, in areas like uh, COVID, in areas where there's going to be very big things happening. So at least we can clarify what those options are. What you're, so what you're trying to get out of those consultations is that the people will have heard their voice come through in a way that sounds authentic rather than their voice being told back to them in a way that sounds like it's what the policymaker wants them to think uh, and that that can be put into the pol into policy. And I think you learn things. The idea is people should know more about their own life than we, we know so that it can be good to hear that in a, in a structured way. Thanks, Liam, again, the, the point. That's, that's very helpful to, to engage with citizens and people to have that, that humility. Um, so we have, if you're able to stay a couple more minutes, we have another question from Maya. Are you able to stay an extra maybe five minutes, Liam? Is that well, I, well, yeah, but, but obviously I know other people may need to leave, so I won't be offended if, if people go, but yeah, I'm staying as long as you that's okay. Thanks, Liam. So we have a question from Myra, um, who works in peace and security. I can give you the floor to ask it directly to Liam, if you'd like. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, working in one of those wicked problem areas, I was sort of wondering whether there's any experience on, I guess, hybrid approaches, um, integrating behavioral science, um, rather using as it as a sort of mindset rather than like a method of implementation. As you mentioned, I think trusting government is very problematic in many areas. So um, I was sort of wondering um, where, if we're interested in using this mind frame or mindset uh, where we could uh, look for examples. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting one. Um, I mean, even as you're talking, it just, it, it reminds me that you know, the idea that behavioral insights work is about, you know, very specific aspects of behavioral change is, is certainly there somewhere. But actually, if you're applying it to, as you say, something like conflict, it seems that the, a, more, a more realistic ambition for behavioral science is, is that it's embedded and that it creates tools of thinking about different aspects of behavior that can be at least partially researched and fed into a process that give the, I mean, the, the concept I would use is, is often legitimacy of the knowledge. So that if somebody's making a statement about the behavior of any actors or groups of actors in a context like that, that there's some process that makes that statement, if not universally true, but at least that there's been a rigor to it. And um, yeah, in terms of examples, um, the, um, I, I come back to the COVID example because I, and I put that up because I do think it was exactly how we would like to do it. You would embed the group and you get uh, the phrase that one British philosopher uses is serviceable truths, which is the idea that you're producing knowledge that isn't intended to be universally true because there's context and there's doubts about claims and so on, but that, that, that there's a legitimacy to it. Um, so I felt in the context of COVID, we were, we were certainly producing knowledge that nobody could point to and say, look, these people have produced stuff that's biased. If they're making a statement about public behavior, they've done it in a way that's trustworthy uh, and subject to measurement issues and so on, but it added something to the, it added something to the discussion. So in the, in the context of conflict, it's so much more difficult because every claim is going to be, is going to be disputed by, by one party or another. Um, so this, this is probably the worst answer I've gave because I, I'm, I'm even, even just seeing so many issues when I go through, but I do think it's another good reason to start from the context of who should be there, what sort of consultation should be done, how you would embed a group like that, and then, and then what are their behaviors? And there's certainly been lots of projects about 
how to encourage sort of intergroup working uh, and those types of things. So some of the things I'm saying are very philosophical, but you go through them, but then you get down to a specific behavior and then it starts seeming like normal behavior science again, that you're evaluating a project, did it lead to a particular outcome? But the thing that I'd love to spend more time on at some point would be what's the process by which you get down to those projects and agree on what those outcomes should be. Because in, in some sense, if you read Nudge or any of these, they don't give you that much of a hint. Um, so yeah, again, sorry, that was my weakest answer because it, it was the hardest question in some ways, but it's uh, uh, fascinating. Thanks so much, Liam. I don't think these have been easy questions throughout the whole Q&A, so thank you for, for putting up with all of them. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for the presentation and for your answers. It's been really interesting, I think, as you can, as you can see, we're starting to grapple some of these questions in the UN context, and um, it's been very helpful. Um, any other comments, Johanna, before we... No, just it was an honor. Uh, really, uh, the questions were, were just uh, so, uh, so thought-provoking and very grateful. Great. Thanks so much, Liam. And um, oh, I'm looking forward to staying in touch. I'll just remember to look forward to <laughs> Okay. Well, bye, everyone. Thank you for joining. And we'll share um, the For Good framework with you so you can have it as a resource. And um, let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.